So today we're going to be doing officially three cases in a row. And one of the specific cases is very, very important and a very poignant case dealing with a child killer. The psychological issues that go on with someone who is uh, a minor, you know, under the age of consent. And what that entails when it deals with murder, when it deals with these serious crimes, we're going to be examining that um, kind of in depth. So I have a lot of extra energy uh, right now, so we're going to be covering all three of these cases. So look forward to that uh, coming up next, and look forward to the launch, the uh, official launching of the channel. It's being done a little more low-key than normal, but that will be broadcast worldwide as, as these videos and similar content really get out there. Look forward to that soon. I hope you guys enjoy. This is some very, very important cases, so pay close attention, especially close attention to the second one. Thank you. Freddie Amber, age 18, a construction worker at Philadelphia Construction. Hitch hiked along the road. He later claimed to have been picked up by Charles Uffelman, an off-duty Philadelphia deputy, heading home after dinner and drinks at Denardo. Within minutes, Hammer fatally slammed Uffelman in the back of the head with a 4 by 4 piece of plywood, ripped his wallet from his pocket, and fled in the officer's silver Monte Carlo. About an hour after, Hammer, meaning Fred, Frederick Hammer, who lived at the home in Kirkwood, North Carolina, of Lancaster County, was stopped for speeding in Uffelman's car in Chester County by the state trooper. Initially, Frederick Hammer denied involvement in the murder, but he began changing his story the second he realized police linked him automatically to Uffelman's car. First, he said Uffelman became ill, stopped the car, and vomited. Hammer said he slapped him in the face once. That caused Uffelman to punch him, prompting Hammer to grab a nearby board in defense. Hammer later admitted to police that he stole $200 or more from Uffelman. But seven months later, the crime was uh, reintroduced. And he claims it had occurred after he rebuffed homosexual advances by an off-duty uh, police official. The allegation out outraged Mr. Uffelman's family and colleagues. Throughout the trial, Common Pleas Court Judge Robert Latrone frequently expressed incredulity at Hammer's testimony and sharply questioned the defendant in a manner Hammer's lawyers thought was highly prejudicial. Jurors deliberated for 30 entire hours, ultimately rejecting the Hammer story, and convicted Frederick Hammer of third-degree murder in what was clearly a compromise, as they acquitted the one count of robbery, citing it being irrelevant. Hammer appealed, citing Latrone's conduct, and the state Supreme Court agreed in 1986 to overturn it. So this crime occurred in 1985, and he should have been permanently locked up. I mean, he had, we know he had the problems. There was a rifle, there was a magnum that was found, you know, but that would all occur later. Um, so I point that out because it's so important for us to recognize that sometimes there are these crimes that will happen and, and a judge or somebody will get involved and just won't agree, or something else might take place where it gets overturned. And in those cases where it's overturned, you know, we should try not to be uh, extremely agitated ab about those cases because that only happens in certain situations. And when you're talking about first-degree murder, which is the only only cases where these convictions were overturned in this instance, um, that can be biased. There can be bias either way. And so when you're talking about a murderer, you know, they're going to murder again. And so we shouldn't be as, um, you know, prejudiced about things like that because no matter what, if a conviction was temporarily overturned or not in any of these state cases, they are going to commit murder again. They don't just automatically reform. So we should know, you know, no matter what, 
that it's a done deal, they're going to be pretty much gone, locked up for life, and so on. And we should remember that when we try to uh, make sense of these cases. And so looking at that, um, looking back on it now, I don't see it as big of a deal that they did have technical problems in one of the earlier trials because, you know, he was convicted in the end for upwards of 71 years. It would have been amazing. First time in history, you know, for a murderer, like a three-time or whatever it is, five-time murderer to automatically change their ways if they were out there in society again. So he offended again, and it was in 2008. And at that point, you know, all of Ash County knew kind of what the murders were. And they knew everything that was going on, and they understood what was what was really happening. So it's just unheard of in most situations, especially any that I've encountered and really studied, that a murderer or somebody who's already convicted of murder, even if their trial was temporarily halted or something, that they will suddenly change their minds. You know, they're no, they're no more going to change their minds than someone who's going in to... Uh, steal from the grocery store, basically. Once they've made their mind up about murdering people, they're going to keep doing it. And so, even in the few instances where it was overturned, I don't look at, I don't look back on it with as much seriousness anymore because, you know, these people are going to be locked up for life anyway. And what's crazy is he actually killed his nephew. Once he was released. Once they released him on a technicality, he went back and killed his nephew. And at least three other people. Um, just very shortly after this happens. Jackie Hart, who works in the State Line store on Jefferson Highway, recalled Frederick Hammer, who was a regular customer, walking up to the counter, pulling his cap down, moving close, and simulating a handgun. What would you do if someone suddenly demanded your money? Hart and the attendant there were not amused. Hammer decided to revisit his past. He placed a call to Joan Ufelman. Don't hang up, she remembers him saying. After nearly three decades of silence, Frederick Hammer decided to talk. He told me everything he said at trial was a lie and he hoped I could forgive him. Ten days after the call, Frederick Hammer was seen at the home of Jimmy Ble Blevins, his nephew, again. And after that, Blevins was killed. Hudler, age 73, of General Motors, who was also a community leader at the time, was enjoying a successful second career on what had become of one of the country's largest tree farms. Frederick Hammer knew Hudler kept large amounts of cash on the property. Two days later, on January 24th, Hammer returned to the Hudler property and fatally shot Hudler. So that's where they find the rifle. They find a 44 Magnum gun that was loaded and over $10,000 in cash and even a tag wear watch. And there's no question he never should have been running around or been out. But at the same time, he was going back in no matter what, just like all of these murderers always do. So... I look, I look again at the, the larger scheme of things, and it makes a lot of sense then. In the July 29th letter, he added, I would love to talk about that night, October 13th. There's a lot to say about that night, and yes, the night laid the groundwork for the rest of my natural life moving forward. Even in his earliest letters, he intimated that he had killed his nephew, Jimmy Blevins, and knew, his, knew the whereabouts of the corpse that same day. In his final letter on August 1st, he described meeting with Williams, the county sheriff, two days earlier. So, he already knew he was going to be moving the body around. I mean, this wasn't on, on the uh, fly. They always pre-plan everything out, almost to the most articulate detail. And that's what's amazing about these stories. And these are true stories. And this is why a lot more people need to be made aware of, of what's happened and be made aware of these stories because it's just, it's unbelievable 
to imagine. And this happened to that entire family. Her son, Mark Uppelman, who was waiting to join the force when his father was murdered, is now a veteran police officer himself. Mark Uppelman said that he initially believed Frederick Hammer did not set out to kill his father. Of course, that's untrue. You know, we know going back in and looking at the court records, he always intended to do it. He just was looking for a way to be able to make it the biggest splash possible, and so he was biding his time for being able to get more victims involved things like that. So a real tragic situation, tragic case. They found everything. They found the bullets and um, he was put away for 71 plus years and I believe he's now, I don't even, I don't even think he's any longer uh, with us or in, in any case, he's either, you know, gone or he's permanently behind bars. So it's very interesting. <clears throat> There's a lot we can learn from this, and so I invite you to uh, get it out there to a wider audience, and let's let's help this grow. Let's help and make sure the channel grows, and uh, keep up to speed, up to date on these very important cases. The Frederick Hammer murders were some of the worst in uh, North Carolina's history, and they've had a lot of different murders from the Ku Klux Klan, from all these different Klan activities, and from all these different groups. But the Frederick Hammer murders were some of the worst. And so, you know, I want to emphasize that we get this out there, get this out to the general public, get a lot more people to talk about it. I think it's great. I think it's a great education as well for uh, people in our society. And he left the weapons, you know, right there at the crime scene. He didn't do anything with any of the stuff. You would think that they would normally uh, try to clear everything out, clean it up as much as possible. But no, it was always just left right next to the victims. And that's what's happened in so many of these murder cases in um, North Carolina, which is quite shocking. There's a few more things to go over with the details of this. Thank you. Asheville, North Carolina. Right outside of Asheville in North Carolina, a quiet town of what was supposed to be a more tightly knit community. The Grayson County Sheriff describes a situation where Freddie Hammer is accused of killing three men during a robbery. And he was in uh, prison awaiting final sentencing. Freddie Hammer told the inmates that $10,000 was buried in a barn at a campground. A rifle, two hidden under bales of fencing, were also buried along with some of the um, some of the instruments that were used. The inmate wrote a letter to his girlfriend saying that he was going to be coming in to uh, a lot of money when he got out of prison, but the letter never reached his girlfriend, and instead. The inmate threw everything away. Guards, however, found Freddie Hammer's letter in the trash can. And when investigators questioned him, the inmate told them what Hammer had said. On May 5th, investigators went to the barn at a private campground in Cripple Creek where Hammer had owned a camper. Five, free, uh, five feet from the inside of the barn's corner. So in other words, right when you first walk in, just as Hammer described Officers dug down and found two cigar boxes filled with rolled coins, money that had been stolen from a safe at the Christmas tree farm, and more. Beneath the boxes, they found a Yadkin Valley bank bag containing damp, moldy, old bills of cash. And this was just the start of what they ended up finding. Beneath the fence wire, investigators found the murder weapon, which was a twenty-two Magnum rifle, with a broken scope on the end of the lens. The scope matched broken scope pieces that were found at Ron Hudler's house. A trace of the rifle's serial number showed that Hammer, meaning Freddie Hammer, purchased the rifle in 1994 at a hardware store. Faced with this evidence, Freddie Hammer admitted Friday in Grayson County Circuit Court that he killed all of the men during the robbery. Just as authorities spoke, he entered a guilty plea. He was sentenced to five life sentences without any parole, as well as two more life terms. 
and Freddie Hammer then went on to steal a safe at Ron Hudler's Christmas Tree Farm on January 21st, I mean 24th, 2008. His son, Fred Hudler, and farm employee John Miller Jr. were also shot. Authorities said two other firearms were then discovered and recovered at the um, actual scene of the crime. I went there with the intention of doing a burglary. It was going to be in and out. So this has a lot of history to it. And on one of these crimes, he was sentenced twice. Um, and one of the convictions got overturned and then he ended up killing at least three other victims. So there was a major mistake in the in the system at the time where they overturned the conviction because of some kind of mistake or something that the judge made um, and he should not have been at all free you know out there in Asheville authorities consider Freddie Hammer a suspect in the disappearance and death of the nephew Jimmy Blevins he was the last person to see Blevins when he disappeared on February 24th 2007 Authorities wanted to question Hammer in connection with the unsolved killing of Tim Shatley. Shatley was shot at a North Carolina bridge a few hundred uh, yards from Blevins' house. As far as Jimmy Blevins is concerned, I had nothing to do with that, he claimed. And halfway after the court hearing, Ash County Sheriff James Williams said Freddie Hammer is still the prime suspect in Blevins' murder. And he absolutely killed Jimmy Blevins, and he killed at least three other people. This was dangerous, you know, and very uh, uncorked individual. He, he was off in a lot of ways. So when he finally got caught and sentenced to consecutive life sentence, you know, of over 71 years, we're going to talk about that. We're going to get to that and show more of what they discovered as far as they discovered a rifle, the rifle rounds were right there directly near where the people were actually shot. So he didn't leave anything out. And he makes all these claims when he goes to prison about how unfair the conditions are because, you know, God and so on never would put someone like him there, you know. And when you read these letters aloud, you really go through what was going on here. You just realize how twisted, truly twisted some people actually are. And um, he certainly not only never got out, he's not going to get out. No question. He's got a, you know, a life sentence of over 70 years. But we're going to explore what led up to this. There are important things to really make note of and take notes about, and we're going to explore those details pretty in depth so I appreciate it thank you more to come. Freddie Hammer age 49 of North Carolina Crumper North Carolina entered with chains around his waist shackles everywhere an officer with an assault rifle would stand guard at the Grayson County Courthouse Freddie Hammer faces five capital murder charges and 11 felonies in connection with those same murders in the January 24, uh, 4th, 2008 killing of Christmas Tree Farm owner Ron Hudler and his son Fred Hudler, as well as farm employee John Miller Jr. The three men were shot to death during an apparent robbery at Ron Hudler's large North Carolina home, according to Ash County and Grace County authorities and the reports. The home is a couple of hundred yards north of the North Carolina-Virginia state line on uh, the Hudler farm. Ron Hudler was found inside his home. His son was in the driveway and Miller was in the detached garage. A heavy safe inside the garage was moved and was open when the authorities came in. An undisclosed amount of cash is missing to this day. The killings happened on a Thursday. Frederick Hammer, who once worked for Ron Hudler, was taken into custody that Saturday, January 26, 2008. 
Steve Milani of Virginia's Capital Defender's Office told Circuit George, uh, Circuit Court Judge Brett Geisler today that the defense had spent $1,600 on a trip to Philadelphia and is going through 3,500 pages of court documents. Hammer was convicted in 1980 of killing an off-duty Philadelphia officer. He was freed from prison on a technical error after being acquitted in a new trial and then was returned in the trial here in 2008. The defense told the judge today that it plans to send investigators back to Pennsylvania and Delaware to talk to all of Frederick Hammer's relatives on former neighbor or former neighbors who knew him. So a very, very interesting case. The victims in the case were awarded $14.9 million in civil damages and other outside standing damages during this whole entire ordeal. So a great history lesson. You know, and um, just please be sure and spread the word. And that most important part at the end, you know, let's get this out there. Get the case and awareness about the case really out there. In this case, Frederick Hammer is charged with three counts of capital murder related to armed robbery, one count of capital murder related to the abduction of Ron Hudler from the farm, who investigators believe was forced at gunpoint, and their surveillance of him you know, doing this at gunpoint, so it makes sense that that's what led to the gunshots. Frederick Hammer is also charged with one count of capital murder related to killing more than one person within a three-year period, so he killed everybody who was kind of a part of his old uh, job. That's the part that I just wanted to make sure everybody... The Hammer case is just is a good case with some disturbing elements into it, you know, and a perfect example for people to use in arguing for stronger laws when it comes to small businesses in general and things like that. There's a lot that people can learn from this case, and it's just the nature of how Frederick Hammer conducted all of his affairs, for sure. So, um, get it out there. You know, we can all stop history from repeating itself as well. So make sure to spread it. If your friends are not aware of this lesser known case, make sure they get familiar uh, familiar with what happened here. It really is a uh, great case to study.